Hi all, this is Jeff Hewlett. I'm a decision confidence builder. I lead Personal Finance Reimagined, a decision-making and financial education platform. So every month we focus on, on decisions, on decision, topic, on decision topics and themes. So we scale from everything from, uh, from more personal finance related topics like buying a house, buying a car, um, doing your investments, getting a checking account, those sort of topics. But also we focus on significant financial topics that you may not associate with personal finance, like getting your next job or like going to college. These are significant decisions that have financial impact. So this month is no different. We are focused on job change. So whether to leave your current job or whether to stay in your current job. And this is a big deal. So research is really interesting on this. It shows a couple things. One is there is bias, right? People make biased decisions all the time. And by the way, this is both on the employee side and the employer side, okay? So that's, a, that's an important part of this too. Also, from, from the standpoint of decision making, Making the best decisions is all about decision process. So that's part of what my company does, Personal Finance Reimagined, is we provide content and tools to help both employers and employees make the best job decisions and employee decisions. So I am super thrilled to talk with Susie Greco today. I've known Susie, I think for over 20 years now. 20 years. Um, so, so great for you to be here. Um, so Susie has deep experience in the talent acquisition field by connecting talented people to the employers. Uh, she is the co-founder of SG2 Recruiting, a recruiting firm providing full life cycle recruiting support for startups all the way to the largest organizations. Prior to SG2, she provided recruiting services for companies for over decades. So welcome, Susie. Thank you for having me, Personal Finance Reimagined. It's Sort of excited to be here and talk about this particular topic because it's obviously a favorite of mine. Ah, very good. Well, thank you. So, why don't we go ahead and, and jump? Just go ahead and jump right right in. So, Susie, you know, when I think of your role, I can imagine you see differences between how employers think about hiring new employees versus how the employees think about whether or not they should make that job change. I don't, what I'm curious about is do expectations between employees and employers, are they different? Are they similar sometimes? And how do they impact their relationship when they're going through that recruitment process? Uh, I mean, all of your questions were fantastic, but I particularly like that one. Um, I think they're different for a lot of reasons. Um, employers, when they are putting out a job, they are looking for people who have had that experience and maybe with the potential to add on to that experience that they're looking for with new in, uh, with new to, um, new experiences, new knowledge. Right. But when employees are looking for a job, they're always thinking about potential because they've done what they've done. Right. They're ready for what's next. Right, right. So there's a little bit of a gap there so between employees. Employers are buying skill set. Employees are looking for the next skill set. That's, That's the most common saying. difference. Okay. So, um, so how they go about during the interview process, how they assess each of the candidates. When they're interviewing the candidate, they're looking for that existing skill set. Right. Whereas em employees, when they're interviewing, they're trying to say what they have done that makes them suitable for what's next because they okay. want to do the job that is being offered. Otherwise, there really is no reason to make a change. So the goal here for when they're making a change possibly is to a more challenging role, a more challenging function, more experience, more technologies, more um, anything that they haven't already done. Right, right, right. Now, how does that, um, like, like how do, I guess maybe from the employer side, like how, yeah, how do- I'm gonna separate the two. Right, yeah, like how do, how do they handle that? I mean, what do they do or, or, or do they, because I, I guess the way I'm thinking about it is when I've thought about this process that you do before, there's the sales side, Mm -hmm. I'm selling the company versus there's the, the, the do side, right? This is what I'm kind of buying the skill set. And I don't know, is it a, a, a like a trade-off or a balance between those two things? And, and it really depends on which industry, because sometimes in the government industry, those requirements are not movable. Okay. They, you absolutely have them 
uh, have to have the skill sets and the knowledge and the years of experience because it is part of the labor category. Whereas in the commercial space, there's a little bit more flexibility because it's it's most of the things are really highly desired because there's no set checklist of skills and experience right. you have to have. It really is just what the hiring manager is hoping to have in the, in right. the, in the individual. Okay. So if you're an employee, let's say, and you're, and you're looking for a new job, and we'll talk more a little bit later about whether or not you should be looking for a job, but let's just take for a second, yes, I'm in job change mode. Should they then be presenting and positioning themselves as, hey, I'm a bag of, of skills. I've, you, and you, here, I have, I have the job requirement list. There's 10 things and boom, yep, I've done either all those 10 things or some of those. I mean, should that be what they're focused on when they're having the discussion in the interview? Um, well, there is research that suggests that when people look at a job list of requirements, um, males, only feel, feel that they only have to have 50% of them because right. the rest of them they can gain. Women, on the other hand, right. are looking at 90%. Like, right, I'm right, not right. going to even apply unless I have the skill yeah. sets, 90% of the skill sets that are listed, which makes it a little bit different from a job search perspective right. and how we deal with that. But if you are able to speak to the skill sets that you don't have that are listed, right. but you're able to talk to them from a behavioral standpoint, from another type of right. skills or experience, you be prepared to discuss them because you want to show you have the capability to pick that up very quickly. So that may be covered in a behavioral question. Right. So I would right, say right. if you um, are applying to positions where you don't fill 100% of the requirements, very rarely people do, um, be prepared to discuss transferable right. skill sets or why it is from an academic standpoint, from a volunteer standpoint, right. from a personal standpoint, you right, gain right. the skill sets that are, that are the ones you don't have. Interesting. So, so one of the things you just mentioned that, that's really fascinating to me um, is the male-female thing. So do you find that when you're working with, with the recruit that you're, uh, and I'm sure you're coaching them individually, but do you find that you're, you're pushing the ladies a little bit more than the guys in terms of their willingness to, to, to stretch in effect or, or whatever? I'm, I'm just curious. I'm really not. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm a technical recruiter, right. so my questions are primarily around skills and experience. How do you right. how do you, how do you self assess? Right. Um, how do you communicate? So the soft skills really are one of those things during the phone screen process. I'm, I'm assessing that, right, um, right. and so it's an up and down, a yes or a no from a communication standpoint. It's a yes or no from a technical skill set. So if you have the required technical skill sets, you're moving forward and you are making the case with the hiring manager whether or not you should be moving okay. forward from there. So okay. my goal as a, an RPO, which is SG2 right. is an RPO, is to deliver candidates who are qualified for the job and the hiring manager specifies these are my minimum requirements that I need to have out of the, the 20 that are listed. Okay. Um, so uh, if I meet those requirements, the candidate goes forward, whether you're male or female, okay. regardless of okay. any other backgrounds. Got it, got it. Okay, no, that is, that's, that is fascinating. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's whether they, or not they choose to apply. Right, so right, the right. question is, am I missing a population right. who haven't applied to the role? But in okay. my situation, right. I can only post in certain places and hope I attract enough people Got that it. they will look and apply, right, but right. I'm not going to um, coach someone to success right. for any reason. I see what you mean. Okay, so you're, yeah, so it's, whether you apply or not is a self-selection. Right. Yes. So it's not like you can see the whole universe of people that could have applied. It's more, did you apply? And then once they apply, then, you're, then, then your job is to assess against and technical And that's a clarification. That's from an application process. Right. So we also do proactive sourcing. So we go on to, whether you call it the job boards or LinkedIn, right. we can go out and hunt for people right. whose skill sets, either from an education standpoint, years of experience, or right. industry, if they qualify on paper, we'll right. reach out to them as well. Okay, even if they haven't declared I'm looking for a job, you're, oh, you're going to say, hey, maybe you should be looking for a job. <laughs> Have you considered right. looking for a job? <laughs> okay, got it, got it. Force them into some right. needing to make a decision. Okay, now, uh, one another little bit different question, but something that I've been really curious about. So, you know, I had, and I and I was, I've been a hiring manager for for decades myself, I'm working in a number of firms and banks, et cetera. Before the pandemic, personally, I, I, you know, I really considered 
longevity as an important criterion, right? Like mm -hmm. I would look at them and say, if it looked like they were a job hopper, I'd be like, you know, I'd be more likely to push them aside. Then the pandemic hit, and I feel like, for at least for me, it sort of changed everything, and it changed my view of, um, you know, length of time, let's say. But you know, but that's just me, and I'm just curious. Since you're in this day to day, has anything changed with length of time expectation? Um, yes and no. So, and, and, and I hate to always answer that question, yeah, yeah. but a yes or no? Uh, yes and no. Okay, so yes, from the perspective of the hiring manager saying, I'm okay if there is a gap. Okay. Not necessarily happiness, but a gap, meaning there's a time when there, an individual is unemployed. Got Some it. hiring managers were opposed to even considering anyone who had any type of employment gaps. Okay. I don't think that that's it any longer true because of COVID, because there were so many reasons people could not be on the workforce okay. for a period of time. So gaps are no so longer So gaps are no longer as, a thing. Uh, I, I don't see that bias happening as much Got anymore. It. And I'm encouraging I did people to identify gaps as gaps on their profiles. Right. So, and even LinkedIn has recognized, I need to find a legitimate way to show gaps on right. their profile, and they've added that as an option. Right, right, right. Um, what has, I still, again, I'm gonna, I'm going to differentiate because I'm a tech recruiter. In the technical space, technology changes every 18 months. Right. So when I recruit for technology professionals, the expectation is unless the job enables them to learn a new technology, they will mm -hmm. become stagnant. So okay. the movement from job to job generally can be just two years. Right. Uh, and if you're a contractor, it could be six months to two years. So okay. the job hoppiness in our industry you really have to ask the question, why did you leave this role? Why did right, you right. leave this role? And it's it's a, a sort of a habit of mine. So right. if I see someone who has not been at the same role for, right. let's just say, you know, I used to say five years. Right, right, right. <laughs> now I'm like, they have to be there two years because okay. they would have learned their skill sets. Right, they would right, have right. determined whether or not that they're going to continue to grow or not grow. So right. I... As a recruiter, now I'm assessing, if you haven't been there for four years, okay. okay, now you can be there for two years, but if you're less than two years, you need to tell me why. Okay. And I'm guessing, like, every situation is different. Like, if you're a person that works for startups or smaller companies, that strikes me as a more dynamic space than, say, you know, IBM or, or some of the Correct. big firms. Uh, or the U.S. government, of course, you know. Because funding, it could be any reason. Right. But as long as you're asking the questions. So if right. you see startup after startup after startup, you need to begin to ask the question, um, how are they assessing the startup? Like if you see like three startups in a row, either they're not asking the right questions. Like are you, right. are, if you're in series A, what are you doing to prepare yourself for series B? Like right. what is your track record? Um, right. You can't constantly go into a entrepreneurial situation and have the same thing happen four times in a row. Right, right. Why, what, have you, what did you right. not learn exactly. <laughs> to ask? That always they they you know they they failed. So I was like, okay, well, okay. that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you asking critical questions during the interview process? Right, right. Oh, that that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it, it's funny because the um, I always I always feel like employees and and people in general they have their reasons for leaving, and I'm just they're not always really good at expressing. Them. I guess, mm -hmm. and sometimes they re leave for really good reasons, and, but maybe they, they're not a particularly good at saying, hey, I had this issue, I had to leave. And, and, and in other words, they're not like, maybe they hide it, or they're, uh, they, they just sort of self-screen it and don't even share it with people. And, and, I, and I think what you're saying is you're better, much better off just being way up front and just mm -hmm. let folks know, like, yeah, this, this was the challenge, and this is why, and, but now, you know, it's time, and I want to come and work for you. I think, you know, we're on social media. Right. We're, we're all, all on social media. So there are so many people out there giving advice saying, you know, provide a reason why you're making that move. I mean, right. there's so many good ones. I'm looking for a new professional challenge. Right. Um, but typically what I'll find is most people are making a move because they become stagnant and not no longer learning or there's no upward mobility right. or the company or contract failed or didn't right. get renewed. Um, so, you know, at some point there's that general response that you know, yeah. what, should I dig a little bit deeper? Like if I see the same pattern over and over again, right. I'm asking the I'm asking right. the broader question. Right. Why are you not as crit using critical thinking skills right. after your third time, third experience? Like it right. should really only take two. Got it. 
Okay. That's, that's my thought. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so one of the things, and it's changed gears just a little bit, and I, I want to focus a little bit on process now. So, you know, I kind of opened up with, in, in the, my preamble, a little bit about bias and some of the research that goes out there. And, and what I'm really interested, actually, Susie, is you, you see companies recruiting processes all the time, right? And I can imagine you see everything from awesome, uh, you know, uh, recruiting processes to not so awesome um, for a variety of reasons. Right. I'm just curious, what what does the best recruiting process looks like? Or if you had to pick a couple of things that really make the difference with companies, what, what might some of those um, be? It, it would be sincere candidate engagement where you are telling them what to expect. So if I believe my process is going to take longer than normal, and right. some people think it's going to happen over a week, some people think it's going to happen over right. a month, as long as you're managing the candidate's expectation, the candidate will, should have a fairly good experience because at no point they're wondering, what happened? Where am I in the right. process? What am I doing? Am, I'm right. waiting for an offer. Right. I know, don't know what to do because I don't know where I am with this particular role. Right. So the best organizations have a clear process for communicating where realistic you, where candidate are. expectations okay. um, regarding the entire process. How many interviews will happen, in what order, and how long, how far apart, right. um, what will happen after the offer. So those kinds of things, right. those are the, the best organizations. If I had to say, if you could do it in less than three weeks, right. that, be awesome? <laughs> that would be awesome because right. that is... You know, right. real, it's uh, sometimes is, is this from sourcing, like all the way from creating the pool, no, uh, all the way to no, interviewing? No, 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 no. It is from literally. It's from identifying the job description and starting either okay. the application process or the sourcing process to the offer stage. So wow. it's not the onboarding stage. It's oh, the it's, offer but stage. It's, wow, that, that sounds like work. Well, as long as you, it is because for us in our industry, it's clear technology. You can't wait. You can't have five interviews. No longer. That's gonna, not going to happen anymore. Right. Um, the the worst companies are the ones that say, "I need him to talk to John," and then let's. You know what? I think they should be talking to Sally. Oh, you know what? Uh, Mike should have been on my conversation. Right. Let's add that, and then we're talking right. four or five weeks later. The candidate had no idea how long it was going to take. Right. They keep introducing a new person, or you know, uh, you know what? Right. We're not sure. Let's give him a technical ass assessment. What? No, no, at right. this point I'd be telling the candidate, yeah, yeah. run, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. this is not a good fit. And it doesn't reflect well on them because it's basically right. showing lack of organization, lack, lack of thoughtfulness. Um, if they are dealing with you as someone they want to join the team, imagine what they're doing to their teams internally. Right. So that's a consideration. Um, so I would, I would definitely say strong process, clear communication. Okay, so if... I'm just trying to imagine. So then if if um, you're doing this and you're in there, I can only imagine that, I mean, you, you I don't know if firing clients is the right word for it, but I I've mean, only ever fired one. <laughs> right. But at some point though, you have to, that, that becomes a problem for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't do your job if, you know, the company's not setting clear expectations and, or they're wandering. Now, does that tend to be like, like, a part of their not very good process, or is it like just an unusual situation with a particular hire or a group that's hiring? In the one company, we found that they were they they emphasized volume and process over the candidate experience. Okay. So that was a problem because while of course I love the work in the business, right. I'm not having a great engagement with the candidates, which my reputation is based on both right. the the interaction between the client and the. Got so it. that was why it didn't work for us. The process was not really um, had the candidate in mind. Right, 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 right. It was what was all what was the best for us and how we do it. Now, in terms of, and I'm just trying to think: is your process is it a a process where you're using tools like workflow tools or process tools that the employer has, that your client has, or do you have your own set of technology that you basically sort of put into the process to manage how the uh, process goes for, for the candidate? As a RPO, it's all of the above. 
Okay. So for those organizations who are um, entrepreneurial or startups, right. they have no process. We walk in with a set process or a recommendation on the process right. and the tools that they need to move forward. So an applicant okay. tracking system, um, recommendations for who should interview and when they should interview, like right. you should have week one this, technical, okay. you know, those kinds of things. Um, and then some organizations we're just supporting um, that have an established process and right. we're just feeding their pipeline of candidates right. and managing the candidates' expectations. So once you go into this process, you'll be talking to this number of people and it should be finished within a certain period of time. So we're okay. just doing the front end piece of it. Okay. So it's, it's all, the entire it, spectrum. It, it depends on what, yeah. and what their needs are. Okay. Got it. But you said the smaller companies typically don't have as much technology. Yeah, so you'll, small, yeah. you'll almost be like the chief recruiting officer or yeah. whatever. That's the that most, I have to say, those are the fun ones because right. you're literally standing up a talent acquisition function, which is, right. Right, right, right. how can it not be fun? Yeah, right. No, that sounds great. Um, so let, let's switch to the other side now uh, from the employee perspective. So just in terms of if you had to give one piece of advice to an employee, a person who's looking for that new position, um, how to either best manage their expectations or in general to have a, uh, you know, a good recruitment process. What, what might a suggestion or maybe a handful of suggestions look like? Um, I, I, just because I've talked to so many candidates, young and all, experienced and sort of new to the job market, right. I would say have good questions prepared. Um, yeah. Not just the questions that you typically would ask, um, at the end of an interview, tell me more about a day in the life. Right. There are some generic questions that I can tell. They literally Googled right. questions to ask right. during an interview. Right. So, and it's always good to have at least four or five because hopefully right. if you're interacting with a good recruiter and a hiring manager, those, those questions should be answered throughout right. the discussion throughout the interview. So you need to have some extras, which is you will obtain by listening right. to content from the hiring manager or the recruiter that you're asking a question that demonstrates you actually listened. Right. I think the one thing that gets me is I talk to candidates and at the end of it, do you have questions? Oh, so, you know, um, how do you communicate? Are you a remote or on site? I was like, wait, what? what? <laughs> we went through all of that at the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> you obviously did not listen. Oh, so, um, so, so, Again, they're just reading a list of questions because someone told them on right. Google or, right, right, you know. Right. So they, they kind of just regurgitate Yeah, back, they regurgitate right. I was like, no, mm -hmm. that, that, that tells me you didn't do your homework. Um, huh. Homework about collaboration, um, the individual team's ability to promote from within. Right. All of those are nothing that you would find in the public space, typically. Right. Um, right. You can't, you, you know, glass door is not going to have that information. Right. So coming to the table with questions that are unique to the and organization. Very specific. Yeah, right. that are more, and, and right. you need to have maybe one or two of them on top of your generic ones that you may or may not get answered during the interview process. Right. But those candidates always stand out. I always tell my client, ask great questions. Right. Which means again, they, they, demonstrates they critical right. thinking. They right. heard what I was saying. Yeah. They read the job description. They did their homework on the company. Right. They came prepared. And they can think on their feet, right? right? Because some of that information had to come in the exchange of information that had just happened. Right. right. Exactly. Right. So that is the one thing I would say would differentiate you. There's so many. The job market being what it is right now, right. there are so many great candidates out there. I'm having to sort of pick from, right. you know, nines and tens. So how do you okay. differentiate wow. yourself? The one way to do that right, is right, right. not to come into this with an expectation of right. I'm going to get by with a generic. So um, yeah. okay. <laughs> what What are the hours for this position? I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, you know, it's funny you mention that because that's that that's. You know, I, I teach at James Madison, and we talk about this stuff, and that's that is my one piece of advice, usually, which is the good questions. Because as, as a hiring manager, that's what I remember too. Right? right. Like you go through the whole process, but it's like, oh, that's actually a really good question. It's you know? their last chance to sort right. of stand yeah. out. Exactly. exactly. I, I a thousand percent. Yeah. So that would be the one thing I would say. Okay. Um, and and we talk about you know you talk about researching, making right. decisions. All of that is based on information. Come to the table and having done your homework about salary, right. compensation ranges, right, um, right, right. you know, all of that when someone asks you, and, and, and I know we're going to be talking a little bit about negotiations a little bit, right. but um, you come to the table understanding what the 
hiring manager or the recruiter's right. expectations are, um, then you can take it. You can take that information one step further, probably further than any of the other candidates right. who are interviewing. Now, do you coach the candidate at all on some of that before their interview? Um, gosh, I want to say no. Okay. There are times when there, someone says something, but I really like the candidate, they said something, I was like, that's something you shouldn't mention. Right. <laughs> like, don't bring that up. Yeah, it's just not <laughs> There a good is idea. no reason yeah. why you need to share that information. Right, right. Um, and, and not in a good way or a bad, I mean, because if it was in a bad way, they wouldn't right. be moving forward. But if it was something that they were trying to be candid, try to explain something, right. you know what? The best way to explain it is personal time. Like, there's right, no right, reason right. to go into some details. So right. if you call that coaching, then the answer is okay. yes. Okay. But that's the extent of it. Right. I'm not going to help unless right. I provide it's the same coaching um, right. across the board. So right. it's a video call dressed appropriately. I don't care what you're wearing from the waist down. Right. But don't come yeah. in, go to the table with a, you know, Iron Maiden t-shirt and yeah, a baseball yeah. cap. It's just yeah, not a, good idea. not a good idea unless that person you know yeah, is yeah. an Iron Maiden fan. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And you, <laughs> had you done your homework? Fine, Pokemon all the way. If the hiring manager is a Pokemon, you know, <laughs> but that is rare, very rare. <laughs> oh, that is too funny. Yes. Okay. Well, so let's talk about negotiation for a second. And, and you know, one of the things, you know, to one of the things that we talk about some that I've talked about some is is you know, negotiation is the outcome of a good decision process, and and it's also a, a really good form of communication, right? Where right you're expressing your preferences, your needs, um, and, and in a way that, you know, at the end of the day, it, it basically says, hey, this is what I need to be successful. Let's talk about this, figure out if there's a way to accomplish that. But, but there's probably a practical side of it as well. And what I'm just really curious about is, you know, is there room for negotiation? How much room is there for negotiation? Do Does every employer a little bit different in how much they will negotiate? Um, just talk a little bit about just, just the general theme no, no, of no, what's available and I'm gonna from say, a negotiation standpoint. And I'm going to say, again, depending on the organization, if you're a federal government contractor, you have a labor category that has a ceiling. Right. Yeah, they it. don't care what, yeah. you know, if you have 20 years of experience and all I needed was five and you wanted to take the job, I'm not going to give you right. what you were making. I'm going to give you what my labor category for that particular role was. So there's right. no room for negotiation in those types of in roles. You need to know. In right. the, in the, you need to know exactly what their ceiling is and they're not going above it. Got it. Um, so that's one area. In you know most most as you know most of the laws now are saying um, uh, it requires you to put uh, job postings. It requires you to put salary ranges. Right. So it's maybe the realistic ones will have a, a maybe a 10, maybe a 20K salary right. range. Um, the ridiculous ones will have a 50 to 100K salary range. And I understand the mentality behind that is because if I'm looking for two plus years and I'm willing to take someone who has two years out of college and someone who's 10 years out of college, that's that range, difference. that's a big difference. Right. And to me, it depends on the candidate, which one, who, which one I like. If right. I get the two at two years out of college, I'm not expecting to pay the top end right. of the scale. I'm going to pay on the low end of the scale. Got it. But you come in and you're 15, you know, you're 15 years of experience, and you're asking for the top end of the scale. Right. I'm going to give that to you as well. So there are there are reasons for it, but um, if someone comes to me and says, you know, I'm willing to take 150 to 200. Okay, great. Define what the role is that you would do for 150, because the manager may see the 150 and say, let's start there. Because right. they're not going to negotiate right. between 150 and 200. They're going to start at 150, and maybe there's a 5K window. Right. Maybe there's a signing okay. bonus that gets you another 10K. That's it. They're not yeah. going to all of a sudden right, throw right, right. in another 150 to 50, 50K to say we right. really want you. That's never going to happen. So when I see that range, when I hear that range from a candidate, I'm asking them to define what is the role that they expect to be doing for 150. What right. is the role that they expect to be doing to get paid 200? Right. And where in this job description? Right. Do they see that? <laughs> right, right. And do they know that? Um, the most you people, know? I, you know what? The good interviewers, they will say, if I'm expected to be an individual contributor, right, I will be on the lower end. But if you expect me to not only be an individual contributor, but, but manage. manage a team, right. and those responsibilities, right. um, you know, sort of put pressure on my day and my time, I'm going to go in towards the higher end. So Got totally it. legitimate. 
right, give right, me right. a range. But I don't normally get that sort of 50K range. It's normally 20, 25K is the difference. Right, but right. as long as you're prepared to discuss it. Got it. Because I'm going to ask. Now, now where are you, and, and, I'm, and maybe I should have started with this, but do you consider your role as representing the employer, the employee, as a broker in the middle between them? Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, how? Hey, Ultimately, you I get paid by the company. By the company. So, in terms of, you know, I guess in accounting you have fiduciary responsibilities. Right. My responsibility is to present the best candidate possible to the client. Right. Um, so, um, I have no financial responsibilities to the candidate, but in my industry, if you have a poor reputation in the cleared space, it's a tiny, tiny market. Right. You. You, you know, you do something or treat someone poorly in this market, right. everyone's right. going to know about it. So right. my reputation isn't worth it. So I'm going to treat them equally, right. but the candidate should always know my my responsibility and I'm being paid by the company. Right, right. No, that, might, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And so as a, I guess it's important then for the employee, the person who's to understand that, right? In, right. in terms of, well... You're getting paid by the employer. You you have a reputation to keep, but at the same time, you're getting paid by the employer. So. And I'm going to say that's a little bit different when you have a contingency recruiter because okay. they are still getting paid by the employer, but their fee is is differentiated by your first year salary. Right. So in some ways, it's in their best interest to no, negotiate a higher salary for you, right. but not to the point where the company says. This is ridiculous. Right. right Not right, only do right. I have to pay a higher salary, but I have to pay your now fee, I pay you. and I exclude you all together. So it's right, that right, fine right. balance. There are those contingency recruiters in the higher levels. This is not really happening at the junior levels, or you right. know, and very rarely do I see it at the mid level. But I do see it at the senior individual contributors and executive levels. Got you it. need to balance that. Got it. Okay. So for what you do with SG two, are you do you ever re do any recruiting out of college, or are you mainly you know, in that sort of uh, experienced higher space? It's more two plus years out of okay. college at least. Okay. In the technical space, you may not even have college. So right. you can just be self-trained um, and self-taught and that's a very highly valued skill set in technology. Okay. So I don't need you to be college educated or certified. I just need you, I need to assess your technical capabilities. And oh, in the that's technical space. So how do you, so you, you're oh, no, assessing thank people? Oh, God, no, I'm not going to do any oh, okay. technical but assessments. You, <laughs> but you have the, a way to, to, right. to, to validate their technical exactly. like I, I do, I don't know, whatever, Python, I, I do R, it's, so. It's, so, you know, tell me when you applied it, how long you applied it, what was your role right. on the team, self-rating, I use that a lot. Okay. Um, and typically, if it's a technology I'm not familiar with, I'll ask the client to ask me, uh, to provide me with two uh, qualifying questions so I can right. dig deeper. So if you say, yes, you have skill A, all right, if you said, yes, you had it, tell right. me, you know, what happens when you do this? And then they right. give me the answer so I know what to look for. So right. I'm doing a preliminary assessment, but, but without having to do any right. coding. Okay. That's so I, I am curious though on that on that coding front, do you find employers are looking for very specific softwares and coding skills like for particular packages or particular softwares? Or is it more of the general knowledge of I know how to code and I can apply it to promote the different kinds of software? Uh, both. Um, in the federal space, if the application is only written in one language, then the preference is that they have those individuals who already know that language to minimize okay. because the they're already having time. to, yeah, they're right. already having to train them on security issues. They're already having right. to train them on teams and, and right, right, um, right. industry. And you um, had already mentioned the whole stretch versus, right, you know, exactly. you're There's buying skills so versus I want to learn. <laughs> so I know R, I want to learn Python and, you know, but maybe, A hiring manager will generally just want specify R and say, this, this particular skill set would take me six months to train, whereas if right. I was just teaching them consulting skill sets, that may take me even longer if I don't see demonstrated communication skill sets. So right. they they weigh out what's more important to them. Got it. But they're assessing that. I'm just telling them what I think their stated experience is. Okay. Well, so good. they make that decision. Well, well um, Susie, this has been amazing and um, and, and really helpful. So okay. appreciate your time okay. today. This has been really cool. But I wanted, but before we wrapped up, I just wanted to see: was there any anything else that we didn't cover that maybe we should have covered? Or is there a question that you wish I had asked? <laughs> or one is it, you, you know. had some great questions. I'll be okay. honest with you. I was really excited about this because of these really fantastic questions. They're not generic recruiter questions. Okay. Um, uh, at, at some point, 
you know, in this day and age, I would share with the job seeker. Um, there are so many tools out there to help them be the oh. most prepared right. um, interviewee. Right. Um, and the most prepared for even for a particular interviewer. So you yeah. have, you know, LinkedIn, it'll tell you about the hiring manager and the company. Right. Um, you have generative AI that will basically right. take your resume, match it to the job description, and pull out what's needed. So if you literally created like the right, right, perfect right, right. resume to be picked up by right. a recruiter. Um, so uh, there's salary information out there. So right. you really should not be going in blind with Right. Any position, I would say, and this okay. is, again, I'm not talking about the retail industry, I'm not talking about the service industry. Right. This is really technical. for the yeah, technical right. and professional in general. Well, professional. Yeah, right. professional. Yeah, yeah. Um, those, the, there's so much information out right. there that you really shouldn't be going in blind as someone who's right. making a decision. Right. There's really no way that you should be going in blind. You should probably know 75% right. of the information for going in blind. Right. That is, so, that is so interesting. You know, we haven't talked about that. Maybe we'll save it for another time, but the use of ChatGPT, the generative AIs, you know, how do you use that as a tool? And I, and I would imagine over the next 6, 12, 18 months, that's just going to explode, right? And that, it's going to become an expectation, right. right? Like, if you don't, it's like, what, what rock are you hiding under? All Why aren't people? you leveraging the tools to make you more efficient? I, I don't know. Right. Okay. That's a good question. Well, very good. Well, Susie, thank you so much, and uh, I'll thank look you for forward to coming to you. Yes.